your feedback. So please do let us know what uh, you think. And so for those of you who have not attended our events before, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center is all about. So in the 1990s, a very special group of individuals based in the uh, north of England came together to create something called the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. And uh, these wonderful individuals were survivors and they were refugees of the Holocaust and of the Nazi regime. And they have continued to sort of, who, who came to England and resettled, but they, they've developed strong connections with the area and they continue to support each other in friendship over all these years. And their work grew and expanded to such an extent that they opened the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center at the University of Huddersfield in September of 2018. And now there is a permanent exhibition and we use the center to teach lessons of the Holocaust and genocide more broadly to schools, the public and various other fabulous audiences. And we are a charity, of course. And so by uh, you're so supporting us simply by attending this event. And of course, if you want to go further, we're gonna invite you to do so in two key ways. You can follow us first and foremost. We've got Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. We're almost on TikTok, but not quite. Um, we're everywhere. Um, we also have a monthly newsletter, so you can keep up to date with our work and events and tell all your friends. You can also make a donation to us, pretty please. As a charity, every penny counts. Um, you, you can go, donate by visiting our website or either clicking on the give and help in the top right hand corner and or going to the bottom right of our homepage. We also have 30 online events which follow four different themes. These themes are pretty, uh, are, are amazing in my opinion, but they're looking at uh, things like memory and commemoration, the ways we can use visual material culture to understand the past, motivations behind genocide and discrimination, and the ways in which we recover marginalized and contested pasts. So the themes are sexuality, desire, and the Holocaust, archives, records, material memory, anti-Semitism and perpetration, transnational Jewish identities at the periphery. And so, the topic tonight, which is also visible within our exhibition and is the core of our survivors stories. Um, it's really about what were the experiences of the survivors and particularly children, especially in the aftermath of war. How did they make sense of what had happened to them. And tonight's speaker is fellow Canadian Dr Rebecca Clifford, <laughs> who received her PhD. Uh, in modern history from the University of Oxford in 2008. She joined the history department at Swansea University in 2009. Her chief research interests are 20th century European history, oral history, Holocaust history, and memory studies. Her most recent research project, Child Survivors and Holocaust Memory, received funding from the British Academy and the Lever Hume Trust, amongst various other uh, funding bodies. Um, and the project is actually the very first to trace the post-war lives of child survivors of the Holocaust from 1945 to the present, exploring how child survivors have made sense of their memories as they aged. Her findings have been compellingly conveyed in her book, released in August 2020, which is called Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust, Yale University Press. Um, it's been nominated for a number of leading prizes in the field, including the Wingate Prize, the Wolfston History Prize, and the Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction. So we are delighted to have her here this evening. And I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, with that, Rebecca, I'll pass it off to you for your short uh, discussion about what the book is all about. And afterwards, I will uh, ask you a, a, a long list of interesting questions about some of the things that are within your book. Okay. And hopefully those in the audience will also chime in with their questions, Please. which I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, all the time that I spent writing this book, and it took six years to write, I often asked myself, what is this book about? And it's a complicated answer because that well, the simple answer, I suppose, is it is a book about children who survived the Holocaust, specifically 100 children who were among the youngest survivors. So all the children in the book were 10 years old or younger at the time of the liberation. So it's a very, very specifically um, a very young group of children who uh, have this experience. They are also all children who are in continental Europe during the war. So they have a, a lived experience of the Holocaust. 
So they lived it. They were there. But because they were very young, they don't always remember. Sometimes they have fragmentary memories. Sometimes they have no memories at all. Throughout my career as a historian, I've always been really interested in, in questions of memory. I mean, I think all my work has always been on how we remember. Why do we remember that way? How do our memories change over time as we age and go through different stages of the life cycle and go through different historical contexts? And anybody who studies memory, um, certainly the theories around memory, knows that memory is a social construction, right? We, we do it together. We do it through our families. So for example, especially for children, children uh, start forming their first memories as they talk to their parents and their siblings. And it's those conversations in the families that embed those memories. And so I think what the book is really about is the question of what happens when you have no one to explain those early memories to you? How do you make sense of them? as you grow older and as you, you know, become a, a teenager and a, a young adult and uh, you enter your career and you have your own children, all those different points in your life, how do you make sense of that, those crucial years, your earliest years, fundamental to who you are, if there's no one to explain it to you? And so in a sense, these children who survived the Holocaust, they're an extreme edge of a much more common uh, experience, a very human experience of how we make sense of our childhoods, especially if your childhood has been chaotic or disruptive or, or you know, disrupted or traumatic. How do you make sense of it? So ultimately, that's what I was, you know, the question I was trying to dig at in this book is, okay, how do you tell the story of who you are if you, if there hasn't been anyone to help you piece that early part together? So the book looks at, um, it, it doesn't look, you know, so much at what happened to the 100 children in the book it, during the war. It looks at afterwards. It looks at the years from 1945 right through to the present. And it, you know, explores how child survivors growing up, becoming teenagers, becoming young adults, etc., how they made sense of their pasts as they aged what kind of questions they asked? Who did they ask the questions to? What happened when their children were born? What happened when their uh, surviving parents or foster parents or adopted parents died? What happened when they retired and they had more time to think about their pasts? It's really a book about the meaning of our childhoods as we move through our lives. And my hope is that although, you know, most of the people who read it won't be child survivors, my hope is that everyone who picks it, up, picks it up sees something of their own experience in it, because it certainly brought me to think about my childhood in different ways and to watch my children and their memories and their experiences in different ways. So in a nutshell, that is what the book is about. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I really appreciate that. I think it's, um, you know, it's so important to be able to do this also as as, as you said, even as children age and they become older and they're say in their retirement, they've got more time to think about their memories and how even that stage of their life can impact how they recall things. So I'm gonna, I'm going to, you know, put some questions to you. I'm going to read a few excerpts of the book just so that people who maybe haven't read it can get a sense of some of the details that you describe. Um, and the first one I want to start with is telling something, you know, something we all question is about telling the right kind of history, whatever right actually means. The problem is, is that there are lots of problematic assumptions around survivors retelling their stories, especially childhood survivors, yeah, child or child survivors. For example, um, children's memories are somehow less reliable and therefore perhaps less valuable as a historical resource, right? Or the idea that children are simply innocent victims of war. God forbid a child actually makes a decision or picks up a weapon, for example, right? Or even that these specific childhood memories are somehow inappropriate to convey given today's social etiquettes or beliefs about how children should behave, right? So you explore this brilliantly in your book. And one of the examples that you give is about discomposure. And for the benefit of our fabulous audience, this, this is oral history uh, terminology 
for when the speaker's story doesn't al somehow align with the collective. So I'd like to read an excerpt of Yannick, and I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly, yeah? It's in any case a pseudonym in this particular case, but yes. <laughs> right, pseudonym, Yannick. And he's uh, Polish, he's born in Poland rather, let's say it like that, born in Poland in 1936. And um, just to give some context to the excerpt that I'm going to read, Yannick um, is being interviewed and he's asked very typical questions during this interview, um, as an adult, of course. And uh, when he's reflecting on the interview with the interviewer after, he explains that he doesn't feel that he gave a really good interview. He didn't really have a lot of information to pass to the interviewer. And the interviewer then turns off the tape. Yeah? But then suddenly the taping resumed with the interviewer clearly having put her list of questions aside. When the recording began again, she was in the midst of telling Yannick a story about someone who she knew who was a child in the Warsaw ghetto and who shot a German soldier. Not realizing perhaps that the recording had commenced, Yannick recalled that he had done something similar shortly after the war when he would have been around 10 years old. He says, that was nothing. It was nothing. I mean, I shot somebody that I recognized. It was a German guard who used to beat us. He says, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I just, I had a gun after the war and I shot him. Yannick added this detail almost as a casual aside. However, his revelation of this memory of retributive violence clearly piqued the interviewer's interest and she began to probe for further details. At the same time, Yannick seemed to realize that the camera was rolling and one can see in his face the fear that he has revealed too much, that the information was too incriminating. Okay, so, whoa, right? Where do we go with that? The obviously not every child you will have interviewed would have shot a German guard, right? Or shot anyone after the end of the war. That's a pretty, uh, yes, incriminating, but that's a, that's a very severe form of violence that's conveyed. And the fact that he's so taken aback at being so sort of casually and uh, simply conveying this information um, is, is incredible. And a lot of interviews and a lot of interviewees, of course, would never be so casual. They would be very guarded. So I guess my question is that for the vast majority of cases, except for Yannick, if interviewees are sanitizing their own childhood or historical accounts, um, then how can we use oral history as a means to uncover what actually happened amongst survivors of the Holocaust? Like that's slightly problematic, right? But but also but also to follow on from that, Rebecca, like are are you searching for the truth? Are you searching for understanding? Like what are, what are you trying to seek to uncover in terms of children's experiences given those issues? Notice that Chelsea has started with the most difficult question here. So we're just going to start with the really hard stuff and work backwards from there. And I hope you, you can't hear the sort of ruckus that's going on outside outside the door of this bedroom. Children. I hope they can sort it out on their own. This is, this is 2021 when you're working from home. So I think the first thing I want to say to that question is, what does oral history do? What are we doing when we do oral history, when we come and we interview each other? If I come and interview you, Chelsea, or anyone in the audience today, you're going to give me, I'm not going to say a sanitized version of your history, but you will justify your life choices because that is a natural human impulse that we all do. We want to present our stories as as narratively logical and coherent and our choices as, as often the right ones. And so we justify our actions. And it's important, I, I guess, you know, anyone who does oral history knows this quote by a marvelous oral historian named Alessandro Portelli, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, uh, he wrote quite a long time ago now, back in, in the late 70s, um, he wrote, oral history doesn't tell us what happened in the past. It tells us what people wish had happened and you know what they fear had happened and what they what they believe happened. And that's of great value. So we're not using 
I don't use oral history as a means to uncover what happened. In fact, one of the challenging things about doing this type of history is recognizing that I will never know what happened in many cases. But we use oral history to understand what aspects of a person's past does that person value right now? When we're sitting there together, we're doing the interview and it's a collaborative process. I don't go and collect it, right? We sit down, we have a, just like you and I are having this conversation now. It's two people together having conversation. And when that person describes their past, they're telling me what parts matter now to them, to their current identity. This is immensely important because it helps us to understand how a person makes sense of their past at different points in time. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at in the book. So the different ways that we look at our childhood, the pieces we pick out to tell, they're going to be different at all the points in our life. If you could go back in time and you know, interview me about my childhood when I was like 21, maybe let's say, I would tell you a completely different story of that childhood than I would now because it looks different from the vantage point of me in my mid 40s with my own small children it looks completely different. So what we get in the oral history interview is not uh, is in no way an unmediated version of the past. It's the version that matters now. And because I'm interested in people's identities and how their histories matter to them, that's what I want. Now, in the case of Yannick, and I have to say, this was a very uh, disturbing interview, not one I conducted myself. It was conducted in the mid-1990s as part of the Survivors of the Shoah uh, Visual History Foundation collections. It's Steven Spielberg's big uh, oral history project with Holocaust survivors. And um, it is a very troubling interview in so many ways, partly because, and mostly because Yannick's own story is so disturbing because this was a child who lived through multiple concentration camps and had a horrific post-war experience as well. Um, and the reason I use a pseudonym, which I don't do most of the time in the book is because I thought this was actually quite a sensitive thing and I could not find Yannick or his family to ask for permission. So I, I used a, I felt better using a, um, a pseudonym, but so, as Chelsea's read, so he's 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 telling his story. He's never told it before, so it's a very halting story, and is broken in a lot of ways. And keeping in mind, of course, that he was a very young child uh, when the war ended. He had only his father left alive, and his father died in 1946. So he had all these memories and no way to piece them together, no way to make sense of them. And so he's telling his story, and then at some point, so in this, um, in the Survivors of the Shoah collection, the interviewers had to had to ask uh, questions off a questionnaire, and they weren't supposed to deviate from that. So he's answering the questions, and he's trying, and he keeps saying, oh, "I don't really know. Sorry, this interview is not very good. I'm not doing a good job. I'm doing my best, but this is really awful." And then the, the video recording cuts out and it comes back and it's clear that the interviewee, they sorry, the interviewer has just put her questions aside and they're just having a chat. And he doesn't realize he's being filmed. And she says, Oh, I heard, you know, some children shot shot Germans after the in the, you know, in the DP camps after the war. And he said, Oh yeah, yeah, I did that. And then there's this look when he realizes, very unethically, right, that they've turned the video camera back on. But what is interesting about Yannick's interview is that he goes on to give many interviews. That's another thing I do in the book is I try to look uh, when an individual has given multiple interviews over time, how does the story change? Uh, and I'm not talking about the change, changing facts. That's actually quite rare that facts change, but the, the nature, almost like the cadence of the narrative does change over time. And what's interesting about Yannick is he never ever mentions that again. Hmm. I think that, and this is my own reading of it, and I could be wrong, but Yannick gives that interview, that first one, when he confesses to having shot a German, before there's really, before a lot of child survivors are telling their stories. So in a way, we might think that there isn't really a, you know, there isn't a way of telling a child survivor story yet. That's coming. And maybe there's still some wiggle room in those early years. Maybe it's earlier than the mid-90s. It might be the early 90s. 
there's still some wiggle room perhaps to tell a different kind of story. I was very struck by that story because there's so much agency, right? Like here's a, a child who's, who's nine or 10 and he picks up a gun and he shoots a German. And that's a, that's a child who's a, you know, he's an actor, right? He's not just a passive victim or something. He's a kid who does something. And that can be hard to tease out of uh, uh, stories. But before there's a kind of structure to what we expect to hear from a child survivor's story, maybe there's a little wiggle room to tell a different kind of story. But once the structures fall into place, Yannick never mentions it again. And I think that's interesting. It tells us something not so much about him, perhaps, but about us as the ones listening and what we expect to hear. Oh, I love that answer. Thank you. I guess following on from that, Rebecca, that in just sort of off the top of your head, in the hundred interviews that you've uh, gathered, collected, analyzed. Do you find any particular patterns over time? Is there any general patterns that have emerged in the ways that those stories are told? Do they become more violent? Do they become less violent? Do they become more touchy-feely, less touchy-feely, like, you know? <laughs> um, I think it, it, for the people whose interviews I was able to look at over time, there's not a lot of them, but mm, I'm going to guess maybe about 15 of 20, 15 or 20 of the 100 in the book give multiple interviews over time, including one who I can see here tonight. And it is a pleasure to, and I'm hoping he knows, he knows that, that I'm talking about. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, there is a fabulous um, person here tonight who I did interview myself, but has also given many interviews. Um, so, so there weren't a huge number of people for whom I was able to, to do that. But I think the pattern there is that the stories become more, more coherent. And that shouldn't surprise us because these child survivors are learning more about their lives as they go through, you know, as they go through time. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, when big oral history projects first started to record the stories of child survivors, archives in Eastern Europe weren't even open to individual researchers yet in some cases. I mean, this was a slow drip so that there were many child survivors who still didn't know very basic facts about their lives because they they literally had to be historians of themselves to figure out a lot of this material. But, you know, very basic facts about their hometowns or even their, you know, mother's family name or I mean, this stuff that we take for granted that we know. So you do see, if you look at multiple interviews over time, that there's a lot more, there's a lot more substance because a lot more is known. We also become more confident the more times we tell our stories. But I think what really shifts in a lot of ways is the expectation of the audience. I was going to talk about that a bit later, actually, but sure. you know, when I think about the language we often use now to talk about, well, maybe we'll have a chance to come back to it, actually. Um, but we we expect certain things when we when we listen to child survivors and i know we're going to come to that in a later question so i'll put that aside and uh, and i'll come back to that okay no worries no worries no thank you very much so went off script but i i think it's it's, inter it's just it's so interesting and it makes and, and that it does make sense the story becoming more coherent the more times it's told because it's almost more practiced or it's more <laughs> yeah it's more reinforced right so obviously, Rebecca, <laughs> this is a fairly, um, th th this, this project would have fairly traumatic dimensions to it, really dark moments, maybe um, some really difficult questions around a person's identity and, and their own notions of family, home. Oh my goodness, so many, so many heavy uh, parts of a person comes out in these interviews, right? And I guess I wanna sort of focus on your own personal experience conducting the interviews because one, of, one passage really struck me um, was with an interviewee you've called with a pseudonym, I'm sure, Leora. Um, so I guess the, the yeah, yeah, I'll ask the question at the end, but for everyone, here's the excerpt from the book. Our interv interview began, as most do, with the exchange of a few pleasantries and small exercises and getting comfortable with one another. But Leora quickly began to look tense. I don't know what to tell you, she whispered. 
I ventured that she should start by telling me her name and her date of birth and uh, the place of her birth, a technique for starting an interview that I've long used for the practical reason that it prevents mix-ups with recordings. But she could not do this because she did not know where she was born or when, nor did she know her own birth name. She wrung her hands, looking helpless. I tried to assure her that I had come here to talk about her life since the war and that I was most interested in the person she was now, not the one she had been at birth, but the huge fact of the loss of her most basic identity, her very name, sat heavily in the space between us. That's extremely moving, right? And obviously I'm, I'm sure that there must have been very similar experiences with other interviewees throughout your project in various ways. And so I guess my question would be for the whole project, the whole book, when you stand back from it, was there any one interview that you found to be the most moving or the most profound um, in that, that, that you conducted that, or that you gathered? So as you've probably already figured out, audience, I knew the questions that Chelsea was going to ask me in advance. So I've spent all day sort of pondering them and walking around and thinking about them. And every interview I did had one moment that I would, I would call profound because it was disarming for me. Every interview had something I didn't expect that blew me away, basically. Um, so I cannot pick out one, but I thought a lot about it this afternoon. And I realized I kept thinking about an interview that isn't in the book at all. So keeping in mind that I looked at 100 different interviews, obviously not all the material, that would have been like 20 books, uh, not all the material made it into the book. Uh, and so there was a lot of stuff that was incredibly moving to me that actually ultimately I could not quite find the place for. I thought I would tell you this story of an interview that is not in the book. So I did this interview in 2015 in Washington, D.C. And the survivor's name, uh, I, he, I do mention him very briefly in the book. I don't tell this part. Um, Paul Zed. So he was born in 19, I'm just looking at my notes because it's actually been a while since I kind of thought about this interview. Um, so he's born in 1936 in Hungary. His mother actually died before the war and his father was deported and he survived with his older brother. And then of course it was Hungary. So they, you know, they uh, lived a, a difficult transition into communism after the war. He was a teenager at a certain point coming up to the Hungarian Re revolution in 1956. So his brother was older. His brother got really, really involved in revolutionary politics, like a lot of surviving Hungarian Jews. Um, and he also became slightly at a younger age, slightly involved in, well, I suppose he was uh, 56. Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't younger by that point. Uh, he was coming up to 20, of course. And so he, um, he got, he, they both got involved in revolutionary politics. So when the Russians came in, they fled like a lot of other people in that, in that space, November, uh, December, 1956, they fled and they did what many others did. They got on a train and when it got close to the Austrian border, they hopped off and they walked across into Austria. And I know about this because my own family and my own mother did exactly the same thing. And, um, and they got into Austria and they made it to the Red Cross, one of the Red Cross camps. And at the Red Cross camp, um, so yeah, so, so he was born in 36, 56. So he's, he's 20 years old at this time, 19 or 20. At the Red Cross camp, there were various recruiters from different universities, including Oxford. And because he and his brother had both been university students, because they were clearly very, very bright, he somehow gets recruited to go to Oxford and ends up at Balliol College. Now, I have to tell you the context of the, the, the physical context of this interview is we're sitting in his study in his house in, in Washington, DC, and it's getting darker and the shadows are kind of obscuring his face. So I could know I was listening to him, but I could no longer see what kind of emotions were playing out on his face. It was just getting darker and darker as evening fell and I was listening to him. And he started to tell the story of going to Oxford and going to Balliol. And 
my expectations were so much that I thought this was the part of the story where he was going to talk about, you know, how he gets an education. He gets a good education at Oxford. That's what I was expecting to come. I wasn't expecting what happened. And so I'm going to read it to you. I haven't looked at this transcript in a long time, but I looked this afternoon. I asked him what it was like in Oxford. And this is what he said. It was strange. Strange. I said, how did you feel being there? Well, confused most of the time. And sometimes I, I didn't even know that I was confused. But yes, uh, you know, I... So, okay, after I finished that, I stayed on for a couple of years as a postgraduate. And so I thought he was just telling the story of his education. And then he said, but, well, a situation happened. In February 1960, my brother committed suicide. He killed himself. I don't know why he killed himself. I honestly don't know. So his brother was his only remaining surviving family member and they'd made it through all this together they'd <laughs> they'd survived the holocaust they'd stayed on in hungary they'd found a place for themselves in revolutionary politics they got out of the country they'd walked across the border they went to the red cross camp they got recruited into oxford they made it to oxford and that's where it fell apart and the reason i was thinking about that today I mean, after anybody who studies the Holocaust, it's, it's not a surprise. Anyone who's read Art Spiegelman's Mouse knows that, knows that Holocaust survivors, it was not uh, uncommon for them to commit suicide in the 50s and 60s. It's not an uncommon story, but I thought about how it upended what I was expecting. It wasn't that Paul's story was shocking. It was that I was shocked and I had to learn something. And I kept thinking, why was I, why are we so enthralled to that story that suggests that an individual survivor's life, that the worst thing that happened must surely have been the Holocaust and it's kind of a march forwards ever since that time. You know, we use a lot of, this is what I was getting at before that I was gonna hold off on those terms. I just think about the terms we often use to talk about child survivor stories. You know, you kind of look at, you know, posters saying there's gonna be a talk and we use terms a lot of the time like inspirational or successful, even heartwarming. And they lead us into a kind of seductive teleological view of these stories. And I talk a bit about that at the end of the book um, because there's a, I tell a story of a woman who, she tells the story of her, this awful experience she has in a ghetto as a child when she's effectively buried in a grave to survive and it comes back to her in nightmares and she can't shake this terror of being, of hiding as a child in a grave. But when I interviewed her, she said, oh, but you know, that wasn't the worst part of my life. And I was like, well, what was the worst part of your life? She said, oh, well, it was when my husband died. And I was so moved by that. I thought it was so radical because it just takes that idea that the worst thing that could have happened to you must necessarily have been the Holocaust. And actually says, no, it was a much more pedestrian moment that many of us will go through the loss of our spouse. And what I'm getting at in all this is that Paul's story forced me to sort of start to question my own assumptions that lives are not linear like that and it's not a sort of like you know progressive march away from disaster but actually that the holocaust comes back and other events come in and it you know that life is much more complex than an inspirational kind of walk away from the worst thing that could ever happen that actually it it pervades our lives and filters into all sorts of places where you might not expect it to be and that having got so far and having everything seem so successful in a way it fell apart for Paul at that moment at the success moment and that was a really important lesson for me um one I, I wish I'd known before in a way um, 
that's what came to me. Now you're making me feel sorry that it's not in the book. But I think there are, you know, there are more books. <laughs> there are more books coming because in a way I will never be done with this material. No, no, certainly. That's really um, fascinating because of course the Holocaust is such a violent and upsetting and traumatic experience and genocide. You, one can only imagine. So you would think that that would be the ultimate pain that someone would return to, but of course it's not. Or at least not of course, it, it can possibly be not the worst thing. That is incredible. Um, okay, switching gears a little bit. Okay, thank you for that, Rebecca. Switching gears a little bit. The, the reason your book is so original and innovative, yes? is that it's examining young children's experiences in the post-war period, as opposed to looking at how adults helped those children, such as other historians like Tara Zara's uh, the, Lost, uh, the Lost Children, or other historians who study the constructions of childhood, right? So the thing that's so interesting, and in it, so you've, you've chosen this, this a very young group of children under the age of 10, which is usually a group that is sometimes overlooked or perhaps considered less valuable because of the issues around memory in that, in that particular age group and because of memories aren't formed until much later. But you use a wealth of sources. So you've got... Uh, your own interviews with child survivors, as, as you discussed, or other people's interviews like Yannick's or interviews with care workers, foster parents, mental health professionals, as well as archival documents. It's a beautifully and exquisitely written book because it has such an excellent balance between the two. It is neither heavy, too heavy historically, and it's neither uh, too uh, subjective or touchy-feely if you can, right? That it's almost lost within the historical experience or the historical historical fact. How did you find that beautiful balance, Rebecca? As a historian, tell me, tell me your secrets. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> That's difficult to answer. Um, I can tell you that I don't think there is a balance. And I am and I don't think I don't think in many ways that we can discover the voices of children in the past in an unmediated way. It is the great frustration that I can use archival documents from the past and I can combine them with oral history given decades after the fact. And do I really access the feelings and opinions and the desires of children? No, of course not. And that is the horrible thing that I had to work around and the enormous frustration of, of working on this book is it's very, very hard and very rare to have direct access to children's own minds in the past. So, of course, working with archival documents, oh my goodness, I had no idea the wealth of archival material I would find for this book. I used archives around the world. I was stunned by what I, I found so much more than I was expecting, so many different types of documents. I used uh, case reports from children from the time, the organizational papers of aid, aid organized, you know, humanitarian aid organizations, like psychiatric files, restitution files, letters, diaries, photographs, you name it, incredible resources. But they are almost all written by adults. And they give us an adult's take on children's experiences, which often is really, I think you could say, not a great indicator of how children really feel. Um, you know, adults at the time were frequently totally baffled by children's behavior. A really good example of this is, um, is how adults write about children's post-war play because the adults who took care of many child survivors after the war were really disturbed by how the children played. The children were not disturbed by this. And so the adults would write things like, well, we've given them you know, dolls and teddies, but they don't seem to know what to do with them. Of course, they didn't know what to do with them. They'd never had them before. One of the um, carers who, who took care of uh, the children, child survivors who came to Britain and spent, um, spent some time in a reception camp in Windermere wrote about how the children 
um, they had given them a wagon or something. And instead of use it to transport the dolls and teddies around, they were like pushing rocks down a hill or so. I can't remember what they were doing, but the, 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 these adults caring for the children were very concerned that this strange way of playing was an indicator of the children being disturbed rather than an indicator of the fact that the children had never had toys so they just come up with their own novel ways of using the toys and that the toys were you know the ones that might have been the most valuable to them are the ones they possibly had had something like in the past and they'd never had a teddy bear so they didn't have any feelings about teddy bears and so I say this only to, just as an example of how poorly sometimes adults looked at children and understood their emotions choices and, and behaviors but there are examples of things that children did um there sorry let me rephrase that you can find children's documents in the archives some a few i've got some to show you <laughs> you do they are problematic in their own way so let me just give you a little uh couple of examples and I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see this, this fine picture? Great. So, sorry, I should put it the, the letter. We can see the letter. See the letter. Uh, sorry, bear with me while I try to get it to start the slideshow. There you go. Still the letter, hopefully. Yep. So this is a letter, um, a letter written by a child uh, named Felice Zed to her rescuer, uh, the woman who rescued her and, and protected her during the war. The date is the 18th of January, 1951. She was 11 years old. And this is from uh, the archives of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And just to quickly tell you what the letter says. So she says, Dear Nanny, uh, we were very happy to receive your letter. I hope you're well. We're well. She's talking about herself and her sister, her older sister. Um, we can't come to see you this year because we're going to America on the 23rd of January on the, the steamship uh, Washington. Last Thursday, we went to the pool and that was nice. <laughs> it's cold here. Is it cold where you are? Etc. Now, just look at this letter and think about how it's all like, I hope you're fine and it's a little cold here. Oh, by the way, we're going to uh, leave for America so we won't be able to see you this year. Wow. So we have to ask questions then about this letter and how much this child knew about what was going to happen to her. And I cannot answer those questions, nor can the child herself because I have spoken to her. We don't know if she realized that she was being pushed into a global migration and she would never come back again. And she would never see this beloved rescuer again until she was 28 years old, I think. That she didn't know what was coming. Or possibly we might assume that she did realize what was coming, but didn't want to make her beloved rescuer worried so just casually dropped it in between the you know it's cold and the visit to the swimming pool we can't know with children's letters um we often have to ask was it did the child freely write what they wanted to write or were they told what to write as we so often tell children yeah write a thank you letter to your nan right like children are often sort of guided in their creations so we can ask that question, how freely did she write this? And how far did she understand what she was saying? But we can't answer it. I can't answer it. She herself can no longer answer it. She doesn't remember writing the letter. Uh, another document I wanted to show you, sometimes we're lucky in archives to find paintings and pictures that children have drawn. Here's an example. Uh, the child here is Fritz F. I think he painted it probably around 1950s. He's around 11 years old, um, same as Felice when he painted this. You can see in the picture, there's like a Nazi officer and a bunch of people being shot against a wall. And the reason I show you this picture is it becomes, it comes from a collection also from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in which there are hundreds and hundreds of pictures, all 
happy scenes of children in their home eating food, doing a dance around a Christmas tree, having a party. This is the only picture in the collection that's anything like this. And it's very interesting um, to reflect on why this child painted this scene. This particular child spent the war in an orphanage and certainly never witnessed any scene like this. So this is entirely a product of his imagination. Now he was in a care home where there were children who might have witnessed something similar. Was he painting something he purely imagined? Was he painting something other children had told him about? Was it entirely fictional? What moved him to paint it? I can never answer those questions. I can ask them. Um, but what I think I really wanted to share with you, if that was just to give you an example of the kind of things that occasionally do turn up in archives. What I think I really wanted to say is that um, it is, we need to think about what makes it into archives, right? The very process of archivization. We archive what we value and we don't archive what we don't value. Archive, ar ar putting documents in an archive is expensive. The archive commits to preserving those things forever. And that costs money. It takes people time to make sense of the documents. It takes a space where the documents won't grow mold or won't decay. It's complex and it's uh, take, you know, resource heavy. And so we choose very carefully what we put in archives. It's very rare that something that children create is considered valuable enough to save forever. I would love to see that change, actually. Um, I think I was, I might let you come back, actually, Chelsea. I was going to tell a story about, I'll, I'll say in the last instance, I tell many stories in the book about the differences that come up between the archives and oral history. That's something I think is really very interesting. And one often finds that the story that a child survivor tells in their oral history bears no resemblance to the story about them that is written down by the adults who care for them in 1948 or 49 or whenever. And that shouldn't surprise us. So there's quite a lot of historians who work now on um, uh, testimony or accounts given by child survivors in those early post-war years. And we need to take those accounts with a grain of salt because children had very good reasons to lie. One of the stories I tell in the book is, um, it's a story um, from the collection held by the Canadian Jewish Congress in Montreal. So. Uh, their, their archives are in Montreal, sorry, I should say. Um, the, Canada had a, can, can, Canada, uh, Chelsea and I are both from Canada, she said. Canada had a really quite remarkable scheme to bring child survivors over uh, that ran from 1948 to 1952, I think it finished. And they brought over a thousand child survivors to Canada. And to go on that scheme, you had to be an orphan. And so it should not surprise us to find in those files that there were many, many accounts of orphaned children who were actually not orphaned. Because if you were a child stuck in a DP camp, which must have felt like a really a place with no future, a transitory place, and you just wanted to move on with your life, it might have seemed in many ways beneficial to lie about the fact that your mother or father was still alive so you could get out. And I think we can understand these things now by understanding that it was a very cruel Canadian policy that took children and not their surviving parents. And that probably any of us would have made that choice. So the Canadian files are peppered with basically cases of children who lie. And I tell uh, several stories um, of, of these children in the book. But there's one I think about a lot because in his later oral history, he never mentions the lie that he lived for something like eight years. And I think, you know, it's an interesting uh, example of 
I have speculated, I have wondered that, you know, if you, if you do live with a lie for such a long time, how far then, and this is, I think this is the childhood years, how far does it actually end up becoming so deeply mixed into your own story that you can't separate it out anymore? So comparing archival records to, uh, to you know, oral, oral history interviews throws up a lot of stuff like that. Um, ethically challenging in many ways as material, but very, very interesting. And, uh, and I think it's those places where there's a breakdown between the archives and the oral testimony. That's where you need to dig, I think, because something important is happening there. Thank you. That's just so interesting. You've touched on so many uh, fascinating themes, also calling into question children, conveying memories about the war when in fact, they weren't there, right? Like drawing that very explicit picture, like that's just incredible. You would never think, right? Why on earth would a child do that? But then children do the craziest things, right? I have two children and they <laughs> lie all the time. So that should really not surprise. Oh, totally right. That shouldn't surprise me, let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm conscious, everyone, I'm conscious of the fact that we're only gonna sort of we're coming to an end. So if anybody does want to ask a question, feel free to pop that question into the chat. Um, but uh, Rebecca, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of push us down the list of questions. Cause one of the things that you just touched on is about children's you know, agency, them lying about their past, right? So it's fascinating. It's one of the most interesting parts of the book, uh, I would say, and one of the most uh, surprising things that you could learn about these kinds of survivors is the fact that they're using their own decision making, personalities, emotions, to navigate the politics of foster homes or to protect loved ones, or even to the extent where children themselves will refuse to be Jewish or bury their Jewishness. Um, in order to be more considered more acceptable or less of a target or less uh, of the recipient of specialized treatment because they don't want to have to stand out against their Christian peers. So obviously that means that children have agency choices, personalities that shouldn't be discredited, right? But, and as you said earlier, they're not passive victims, but they're active survivors, right? So one of the questions I'd want to ask is sort of, okay, what, what can we learn from this? How do we use this idea to say, make relief practices or, or aid more the effective towards children? How can we use it today in today's resettlement practices? Um, do you see a relevancy within, within today, with these kind of historical findings within what we do now? How can we avoid doing it again, you know? I think the situation has changed so much now that the things that I think of to recommend are probably now common practice. I certainly have that sense. I was uh, worked on a project a few years back with people who work for different charity, children's charities and aid organizations. And the, the extent to which things have changed is really remarkable and maybe it shouldn't surprise us. I mean, there's basically been a, a sea change since the 1980s in terms of how we listen to and respect children's voices. A lot of things happen around that time. It was in the 80s that uh, children's uh, voices first became like admissible in court as the children could give evidence off their own bat for the first time. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was uh, came into full force at that time. I mean, there's a way in which it's been a slow drip from the 1980s on, so most of, most of my life really. Um, that we've seen a greater understanding of children as agents, as human beings in their own right, not simply as, as objects, as it were. Um, I think we have a sense that children have up to a point a right to their own choices. Um, and actually, I think we, we, in 2021, we find ourselves in a, in a kind of interesting situation where we now respect children's own choices and identities enough that we are kind of finding it hard to find the um, boundaries to the concept of safeguarding. I actually thought about it a lot. I don't know if anyone else followed the case of 
uh, Kira Bell that came up and this was a high court decision um, about a, a child who was um, born female and was transitioning to male and was given um, puberty blocking drugs from a, from a young age and then has now brought her case to court saying she really shouldn't, shouldn't have had to make such a life altering you know, shouldn't have been allowed to make a life-altering decision at such a, a young age. I think we're in this really interesting space now where we want to listen to children's, you know, children talking about their identities, claiming their identities, having their own opinions up to a point. So where then do the boundaries of safeguarding lie? Um, and this is a cultural shift in terms of how we listen to children that's taken place in, in the majority of, of Western countries since in this time period. Um, and so I think in terms of how we help child refugees, for example, or children in conflict zones now, that we are far more attuned to the needs of children than we ever were before. And yet we still find ourselves in this, if I step out from that and look at the broader picture, we are also a lot less welcoming of child refugees and child survivors of conflict than we were in 1945, let's put it this way. So I think the short answer to the question is, I would like to see us welcoming child refugees the way that many child survivors of the Holocaust and child refugees coming in 1938 and 1939 were welcomed in this country. Uh, maybe welcomed is too strong a word, but, um, but, but many, many came and many, many stayed and that just is not true for child refugees anymore in the same way. Mm -hmm. I quite agree. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, come through in the chat. Um, so uh, there's a question come through to me from Michael, um, sort of touching on um, what you were saying earlier about um, um, poorly formed memories of early years and how did Rebecca confirm that the stories were not false memories, particularly when other survivors might have had totally different perceptions of the same events. So not necessarily from archives and things contradicting um, or presenting alternative um, testimony, but other survivors talking about the same atmosphere or same place or same event. Um, and, is there, and I'd like to ask, is there value in those false memories themselves because of their nature? That is a very, that is a question I write about in the book, uh, towards the end of the book. I talk about false memories, um, but not in the sense that I look at false memories in any of the 100 children whose stories are in the, in the book, because in a sense, I can't. I can show you that there's a discrepancy between the archives and the oral history, for example, but it's often the archives that is the false testimony, if you see what I mean, because children had motivations to lie. I think the more complex issue is the very rare, but nonetheless very kind of picked up by the sorry, there's some kind of song and dance going on outside the room. See, children, children are agents in their own right. And you might want to do things one day, one way, and, and they might want to do things another way. As uh, living, living proof right here. And I totally lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. So in the 1990s, there were a, a small handful of books published by people claiming to be child survivors. Some of these books did incredibly well, were translated into multiple languages, sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and they were not true. That, I think, is where false memories get very, very, um, gets into a very difficult ethical category. Um, because if somebody claims to be a child survivor, publishes their story, and actually makes quite a significant profit off of the story as well, and then it turns out that they are not a child survivor, then you are in difficult, uh, you are in difficult territory. I will never forget that um, the first person I interviewed on this project, she, we talked and we had a lovely you know, afternoon together and we had lunch together and she told me her story. But when we were finished, she said, I just want you to remember, this is my story. I own the copyright to it. It's mine, not yours. I said, of course. And actually, you know, I will never use it in any way that you don't want me to use it. And she said, well, the thing is, 
it's very, very important to me and important to many of us that we get the facts as right as we can, that we tell you a story that's true, but also that you understand that it's our story. And that's because we have had, you know, issues sometimes with people who claim to be child survivors and, and who aren't. So this is a very ethically sensitive issue really. And all I can say is that in the stories of the people I interviewed, I suppose, you know, I took what they said at face value. I looked at it in the light of what I found about them in the archives. I never encountered anyone that I thought was not telling me a true story of their lives. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that truth looks different at different points. Um, I'm trying to find a, a sensitive way to explain that sometimes the story in the archives and the story that somebody tells you is not the same, but there is a value, great value to me in the story that someone chooses to share with you, which is like a precious gift. And so in those cases, like, for example, the case of, of um, some of the children in the Canadian files who lied about their parents and then who kind of continued to live the lie in oral history they gave 50 years later, well, I wasn't going to point the finger at them and say, oh, they're lying. I think they're, they're telling this story that wasn't personally to me. They're telling it for a reason. It's my job not to say this is a false memory. It's my job to explain why. So I hope that helped. That was very eloquently put. Um, I was reminded when you were saying about false memory and um, what would you do in the same situation of um, the um, of Robert Rinder and uh, his grandfather, who um, who did lie about his age um, to come over as um, one of the group of um, young people um, to Windermere. And but who amongst us would have would have honest? It's such a difficult. It's an impossible choice. So. And I am doing, um, I'm doing an event with Robert Rinder for Jewish Book Week, if anybody wants to uh, come along and explore that further. Um, I have one final um, comment that's in the chat, um, and then we do have to, I'm afraid, end it um, for this evening because time is getting on. Um, um, and I'm wondering whether there's a personal story behind this one. Um, Jackie um, is um, saying, had you heard of the files in the Wiener Library? Um, from Gertrude and Sophie Dan um, there um, in the archives is uh, 1070. They sure are. <laughs> so um, yes, I so I should explain who Gertrude and Sophie Dan are. Uh, Gertrude and Sophie Dan were two um, emigre sisters who came. I I can't remember if it was 1938 or 1939, but they they came to Britain um, before the war. And they helped uh, Anna Freud, who was the daughter of Sigmund Freud and herself the founder of the field of child psychoanalysis. They helped her to run um, what's often referred to as the Hampstead War Nurseries. The Hampstead, oh, this, is a, this is a long story. This is also, coincidentally or not, this is actually the topic of my next book, which will look at this uh, group of uh, many of them German and Austrian emigres who cared for a small group of child survivors after the war and the sorts of choices they made, what happened to those children, the children's own uh, memories of the, that experience and the relationship between that group of children and the world of British uh, psycho, uh, psychoanalysis at the time. So yes, yeah, so the Dan sisters um, were responsible for watching a small group of children and taking notes on their behavior which uh, and these notes were then fed back to um, to Anna Freud who then wrote about them from a psychoanalytical point of view in fact she wrote a paper uh, about some of these children which is such a seminal work of child psychology that you can still find it referred to in pretty much every single book on child developmental psychology. Mm -hmm. And yes, I have those, I read those wonderful uh, archival um, records of the, these two sisters, the Dan sisters own take on that experience. There's so much there that we can learn about Britain in the early period after the war about 
um, how a generation of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts were thinking about children's minds and children's development and how that was informed by this little group of children and that is what I I myself will be writing a book on if my own children ever get out of the house and go back to school because at the minute I can't seem to find a quiet space to write in but it's coming so watch the space excellent it sounds fascinating absolutely oh this is just brilliant do we have any more we're, we're good Alex okay well Rebecca this has been a wonderful evening I love talking about your research in this fabulous book um, so I'm going to thank you for generously contributing your time and your insight to my many questions, which were, you know, I liked asking the questions tonight. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Well, how we should do more of these, right? So obviously I'd like to thank everyone else for attending as well. And as I, we said earlier, we're going to send out an email with the link for the recording, as well as a short survey, please. We'd love your feedback. Um, our next talk, Alex, will be on the 25th of March. She's going to show a picture. 25th of March, mid-level managers of the Holocaust. We're putting two, uh, <laughs> this is gonna be, the, I'm, I'm, I'll be doing the, the interview for this one as well. Uh, uh, Alice Kai, Daniel Lee, they've both, <laughs> oh my God. They've both written um, two biographies of mid-level Nazi managers. And we're gonna find out how they facilitated the acts of the Holocaust. It's all about anti-Semitism and perpetration and very fascinating to learn about the bureaucracy that was the Nazi regime. Um, please remember that all of our events are free, um, So, but, but we are a charity and uh, the link to the Just Giving page, Alex, should be also in the chat right now and you're welcome to please follow us on social media. And uh, Alex, I'll just ask you to take that down again so we can thank Rebecca if that's okay. She has to do 15 things, she's like an octopus right now. Thank you, Alex, for facilitating tonight's technology. We appreciate it. And Rebecca, once again, thank you so much for your fabulous uh, chat tonight. This was amazing. Everybody, yay. Thank you so much to, you, to Alex, to Chelsea for some, I told you the first question was the hardest one, wasn't it? And thank you to everybody who's come and it's been lovely just to look out and see your faces. And I'm sorry, we're not all in the room together, but uh, next year in Jerusalem, as they say. Yeah, totally. <laughs> thank you very much. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank Take you. Care, everyone. Bye now. Bye.